Welcome to Insight, I'm Wendy Brokaw. Did you know that the city of Salem has over 250 known archeological sites within its boundaries? There's a lot of history below the surface about life here both before and after European settlers arrived. And the city has made it a priority to preserve these and other sites in the future with an equal effort to learn about our area's true history. We're going to talk about one such project, a multi-phase project at the Willamette Heritage Center and Willamette University involving the Indian Manual Labor Training School, which is believed located there. What was it and why? And what have they learned so far? And why is that so culturally important? Like any archaeology, this dig is about physical proof of activities that occurred here. It is bringing forward the identities and the evidence of what happened with the woolen mill here, what happened in this space prior to that woolen mill that may include being the um, industrial school for Native Americans um, established by Jason Lee in the late 1830s, and all of the materials that date to that period. And we know that from tribal stories and family understandings of those that survived living here, what some of those materials might be. They might be pieces of glass that were napped into um, the equivalent of stone tools. It might be pieces of bottles or elements carved into toys that would have been part of a child's uh, life here. Good archaeologists like here are not just seeking to find something, but to provide the context and the understanding that goes with what they find. It's not just discovery of an object. It is the context that goes with that ob object that sets the stage for the broader understanding for conveying what actually happened in history based on a material evidence. Would you please welcome my guest today, Kimberly Fitzgerald, the City of Salem's archaeologist and head of the Historic Preservation Program, and Chris Bailey, cultural protection specialist with the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde. Let's start with congratulations. <laughs> The City of Salem's Historic Landmarks Commission has won the 2024 Oregon Heritage Excellence Award, honoring it for its innovation. In fact, it has a history of innovations with the status it is now a state model for archaeological preservation. Yeah, thank you. It's Very an exciting. honor to be recognized by the Heritage Commission. Uh, tell us how that innovation worked for the archaeology project at the Willamette Heritage Center. Um, yeah, so it actually started back in 2019, and um, Chris and I, along with several others um, from uh, the SHPO State Historic Preservation Office uh, and the, the Confederate Tribes of the Salets, we had been working for a while on developing a local program that would help ensure that um, known archaeological sites would not be adversely affected by development. So um, our, our archaeological compliance has been integrated into our planning, land use, and building permit processes. So there is a site located at 990 Broadway. Uh, it came through our pre-application uh, process, which is a normal process for new structures, and the property owner at the time had proposed a new um, multi-component building with with um, residential and commercial on the on the bottom, and they were proposing to construct it on the site of the Jason Lee House. So the Jason Lee House was built in 1841 by Oregon Methodist missionaries, and you know, at the time, it was just a parking lot um, and a vacant lot, so nobody knew that there was anything there. But the way our process worked, um, it triggered our local compliance review. And the property was privately owned, but we decided that, that our uh, archaeological program 
would work with the property owner to do the necessary archaeological testing there to ensure that uh, what remained of that original 1841 building, which is over at the Willamette Heritage Center now, it was saved in the 60s and moved over there, um, to ensure that that original uh, foundation and any other uh, remnants would not be adversely affected by the development. So that was our first project there. And um, Chris, along with some other members from the Grand Ronde tribe, uh, assisted us with ground penetrating radar initially so we would know where to do testing. And the testing that we did was actually in uh, spring of 2020, <laughs> right at the beginning of the pandemic. <laughs> I know. Um, but we were able to locate what remained of the foundation there. And the developer then um, did a little bit of redesign for his, their underground utilities to avoid impact it. But that was really the first step and it really started um, our interest in that really early first contact period. We had done some other work at the police facility just to um, just nearby this site. Uh, and, and so in terms of research, <laughs> we've actually identified as a priority in our Landmarks Commission work plan the development of a National Register no nomination. So why it's multi-phase is that the Methodists built um, a number of buildings between, well, they actually started in the Willamette Valley in 1834 up at Mission Bottom, and then it wasn't a really good location. It kept flooding, so they moved to what is now Salem in 1841, and they built the Jason Lee House. They built a mill nearby. They built the Parsonage Building, which is where we just finished up our field work, and they also built the Indian Manual Labor Training School on Willamette's campus. Chris, let's get back to the idea of a Indian training school. Back in the day uh, in America, there were a number of so-called Indian boarding schools, and this qualifies as one of those. Am I correct, this this training school? I think so. I mean, it, it was sort of a proto style. I mean, it was run by the Methodists. It wasn't run by the uh, U.S. government. As I understand it, the U.S. government back in the 1830s was establishing a series of many such schools. Uh, Indian schools, boarding schools, where they actually sent kids to these schools, and they were paid by the, the, the missions, a number of missionaries were actually able to run these schools with government money, am I correct? Yeah, the, in 1819, the Congress passed the uh, Indian Civilization Fund Act, uh, terrible name, I think, but it uh, allocated funding um, to be provided to religious organizations to send people of what they called high moral character to establish schools for indigenous children and under the guise of civilizing them. Did the so-called Indian children go to these schools voluntarily or were they sent? Uh, a mix. I mean, a lot of times there was a convincing parents to send them to these schools. Other times the convincing, um, there were there may have been tribal families that decided to send their kids to those schools because they figured it was the only way to survive. Um, it, it may have depended on, it, it, a lot of times it depended on circumstance, but the whole time there was this backdrop of uh, like threat over the top. So it didn't matter if it was voluntary or not because this, their, life, their way of life was irrevocably damaged through uh, the removal acts and being able, being forced to reservations or forced into the margins of society. And some of the goal of a lot of these government acts was to get the tribal people off the wanted land, the desired land, which in this the case we're talking about is Willamette Valley, get them out of the Willamette Valley and then train them to be farmers or other types of laborers in order to get them away from our traditional life ways. And the reason for that is our life ways involved us having to be in our homelands. And if you can break them from that connection by teaching them to be blacksmiths or 
carpenters or farmers, then they end up taking up the European or American way of living. And then it breaks that connection of their, uh, the tribal people from that land as well. So now we don't have this idea of the tribe owns this area. The tribe is in caretaking of this area. It's individuals. They're breaking the, up the tribal function as well. Now you're focusing each, each family gets an allotment. And now you're training those families to live as a family unit, not live as a tribal unit. And so you start breaking those bonds further and further to try to get people to live more like Americans, I guess, is the sort of the goal. Many of the tribes were displaced and they had to have some place to go. And uh, how many were initially involved with the Grand Ron? Um, I mean, over 30 different tribes and bands were removed to Grand Ron from different places. Some under treaty, some eventually came there later because they didn't have treaties and they needed services. Um, so you have all these, it's the understanding, I'm trying to understand when we talk about tribes, a lot of times when Americans are talking about tribes or when you're learning about tribes in this, uh, in the common uh, parlance, people think these giant, very organized groups, uh, a, like a monolithic group of tribal people, like what you'd think about with the Plains Indians or even back east, but like when you're talking about tribes here, it could be just a single village that's made up of a number of small families, and another village could be nearby, and they may be related, they may have a number of things that they do together, or shared use areas, but they're autonomous as well. And so when you're talking about tribes, it's not the Kalapuyan tribe, it's the Kalapuyan people, which could be various villages or groups of people that lived within the valley. So eventually, the U.S. government, as I understand it, had formed treaties which they ended up breaking with the various Indian peoples and eventually moving what was left of the people in the areas that hadn't been displaced already onto reservations. And those reservations were not in lands that the people had known as their own lands. They were far away often. What do you hope for this particular project meeting your own cultural aims of the Grand Ron? For us, being part of this and uh, working with the City of Salem and working with the Willamette Heritage Center, it's important because some of the work I do is trying to fill in the blanks. We don't know where are the, all the archaeological sites are. We don't know where everything is. And we do a lot of research on uh, places within our homelands trying to determine where certain places were. And every time you can sort of fill in a blank of where an archaeological site is, in research you may have something that references a place, but you might not know where that place is specifically. And once you can find that place, then it starts knocking down the dominoes of where other places are because you have other references that help you triangulate. And so for me, that's always important to find out where certain things were. Once we find a place, it starts justifying other pieces of knowledge and it helps us understand where uh, we were on the landscape, what was happening on the landscape at a very specific point in time, because that's the other piece with archaeology is everything's a very, mm -hmm. a lot of times it, it's a discrete point in time. It can be a long period in some cases where it could be a long occupation, but like when we're talking about, especially when we're talking about that historic period, it feels like so long ago when it took forever, but it could be a small time of like five to ten years of when somebody was right there and then it's gone. And so you're trying to understand because you have all these other small discrete periods of time that are all connected and you're trying to like put this puzzle you're putting a puzzle together that you're missing 75 percent of it and you're trying to figure out what the picture is mm -hmm. i notice you smiling yeah. There. Yeah. <laughs> but you, you know it, we talk about indigenous peoples or people who are here pre European American settlement. Uh, I've had figures thrown at me of 14,000 years of habitation in our area, but you say, no, we, call it, we say time immemorial. What do you mean? So time immemorial, before you remember, before time was even recorded, before you understand. We have stories that go back to the Missoula floods when the Willamette Valley was an ocean. 
Mm -hmm. I mean, when it was an interior sea, the stories travel through and in a lot of cases, it seems fantastical to some people that like these stories would, like these oral histories and oral traditions would be accurate, but then archeology span comes along and does something and then it's like, oh, that, <laughs> This is what happened, and we're like, yeah, we, we told you. <laughs> You're an archaeologist. You know what he means by oh, yeah. that, going yeah. layer after layer. You don't yeah. just dig up the mm. earth. You scrape it away. Mm -hmm, <laughs> mm -hmm. So we don't miss anything, exactly. And when you find something, how do you treat it? Give us an example. Ah, it depends on what it is. Mm -hmm. So um, one of the key things that uh, is really important to the work we do is understanding the stratigraphy, the soils. So if you can imagine like if you're familiar with rings on a tree, for example, you can, you can figure out how old a tree is by counting the rings. Many kids know that. But stratigraphy is the same way. You can count back to when the Missoula floods were. They left a particular kind of deposit. So you can you can see that when you dig deep enough, you can get down to that Missoula flood layer. Um, the historic period in Salem, it's funny because I've done it long enough now where I can generally see that I can figure, I can look at um, the stratigraphy and it's at least the sites we were working on, uh, Willamette University and the Willamette Heritage Center, they're generally about 30 to 40 centimeters <laughs> below the surface, uh, but then can extend down to about 80 to 90 centimeters, depending on where you are, depending on the disturbance, the redevelopment. Uh, our favorite thing as archeologists is that you have an undisturbed uh, historic layer, so it's all intact. But if it's been redeveloped as in an urban area, that's honestly more common than having something be undisturbed. Um, and then you have to, like Chris was saying, then your your pieces of the puzzle get even more complicated to unpack. I'm beginning <laughs> to understand yeah. that. But we did find evidence of what we think is a portion of the Parsonage Foundation at 80 centimeters below the surface. We've got some wood and some square nails, and we were able to also find uh, fragments of ceramic transfer print, transferware, which um, we can date to that particular period of time. But as Chris mentioned, it's the, the Methodists were only on these sites from 1841 to 1844, a very short period of time. And so it just makes our work a little bit more challenging, but it's also more exciting when we think we find something associated with them. In this case, we're really lucky in that um, uh, archaeologists at Oregon State University did some archaeological excavations up at Mission Bottom. Um, there's a state park there. That was the first location of the Methodist that where they built their first mission house that I mentioned was terrible and kept flooding. <laughs> but they were able to find quite a lot of artifacts and ceramics. So some of the ceramics that we found um, both here at the Parsonage site and the Jason Lee site are the same as the ceramics that were at Mission Bottom. So that, again, is another piece to the puzzle that helps us know, okay, we're in the right level. <laughs> Str it confirms yeah. that they, yes, indeed, did mm -hmm. move there. That's yep. one thing that you have to ascertain every step of the way. I see that your primary sources aren't always there when you need them. Right, and we're continuing even now to do research into primary sources because um, this is a multi-phase project. So we're doing a, a national register nomination. It's called a multiple property document. So it's funny because we started out intending just to do the Jason Lee site and then we expanded to the, all the sites um, in Salem and then it became the Willamette Valley and now it's all of Oregon because the State Historic Preservation Office is, they're like, yay, you guys should do more. So I, I understand you have uh, a map and yes. I looked at it and it has uh, boundaries around it. Tell us about that. Oh. What's it called? So this is our, if, if it's the map I think you, you looked at, it's the, it's the MPD, the, the area where all the Methodist mission uh, stations were established. So between, um, well, it was really 1834 to 1844, that's when they were active. And it wasn't even a Oregon territory yet, it was Oregon country. It wasn't under um, a treaty, just a, it was both the British and the United States were allowed to occupy this area 
even though it, it was not our area to occupy, but that's a whole other story. It was just the, the Europeans and the Americans uh, fighting over this area. I believe in, even the Russians were interested in it. Um, and at that time, um, it was the Methodists. They were here um, as the only missionaries for a while until the Catholics came um, and settled. Did the native peoples have a clue as to what was happening to them? How did they treat these first white people coming here? What I mean, was the attitude? Uh, some of them they tried it as, uh, you'd see them treated them as trade part. It just depends on the purpose that people were coming. I mean, um, you get certain tribes that were very economical in nature and they were looking at they were seeing as white people were coming that this is an opportunity to increase economic power in some tribes and some uh, uh, some tribal leaders would basically block access to the white people that are coming over to other tribes to be the one that everybody has to deal with so basically all the other tribes have to deal with these people through themselves it, I mean they were the economics were very complex back then, so that's it was looked at that. I mean, before Lewis and Clark, you had people that were, like, you'd have ships that were stopping along the coast and shipwrecks, so you you already had this understanding that people were coming. I mean, that's the whole point. Lewis and Clark were trying to find a a river that ran east to west, and they didn't succeed in that level. I mean, they got to the Columbia, but it didn't run as far. They were hoping to find one that would run all the way Mm -hmm. to the other side of the country, but they didn't find that. They kept finding all these other rivers that would end up end. Um, so you end up there looking for this access to create more economic opportunities. That's what everything was about, was like the economy. They're trying, the U.S. is growing at the time. They're trying to find more land, more economic opportunities, more natural resources, and able to exploit these. And you had tribal people that knew the value of what they had and so they're dealing with some of these but at the time after Lewis and Clark I mean even before Lewis and Clark but definitely after you're dealing with um, these regional tribal powers are starting to become weakened through disease and death you already have you're having villages have to consolidate or empty because people uh, didn't have the immunities to the European diseases. I mean, the Europeans didn't have immunities to some of these diseases either, and people were dying mm -hmm. wholesale, but the tribal people really got mm -hmm. hit hard by stuff, especially diseases that are being brought over from the Philippines and from other, the tropics. You're dealing with malaria that's popping up in the U.S. because all this stuff is coming along with it. The children. There was a great effort on the part of the U.S. government and the missions to save the children. Why? Uh, it's more just to, I don't think they were worried about the welfare of the children per se, but if they could educate the children and separate them from their family and culture. We have letters that basically were written by superintendents that say the whole purpose of this is to separate them from the practices and the, their family's practices and get them trained, get them dressed in suits and dresses and make them cut their hair and become good American citizens and then watch for backsliding when they go to the reservation. The whole goal wasn't, it was to I mean, the quote I've seen is, save the man, not the Indian, because you're trying to, they were, in their mind, the tribal person was lower than them, and they wanted to create this, they had this ideal at the time. America had this ideal of what the ideal American looks like, and that's what they're trying to bring the tribal people up into, because there was, they knew the tribal, uh, all the tribal peoples in the territories had claim to the land. It was already affirmed they had claim to the land. That's why they had to do these treaties. And the treaties didn't cover probably everything that they wished they would. So in order to ensure that they're breaking the power of the tribal people over those lands, they're trying to turn them into basically their model of European Euro-American settlers. They're trying to get over there and train those students to be farmers and likely Protestants and like they they have this idea of this Ameri American ideal and they're 
pulling them from their families to train them to do this. And it's also partially because the government, as soon as they made these treaties, they started doing what they could to cut back on the promises they made on them. So if you could break the tribal organizations and turn them into single American families, then you don't need to provide all the things that you promised those tribes anymore because in theory they're becoming self-sufficient so if you're self-sufficient you don't need government welfare any longer you're making it sound like a long breathed plan with this as the outcome i'm oh yeah i mean what i'm sure uh. so i so part of my research i came across um the, it was in 1818, actually, President Monroe, who was one of the founding fathers, and he was the one who um, asked Congress to establish this Indian Civilization Fund Act. Um, and in his address to Congress, he clearly stated that the reason that he felt it prudent to invest in these Indian boarding schools was because it would not be feasible to, as he put it, assimilate the adults, that he had um, just come off multiple military engagements with uh, tribes in the east where they were trying to hold on to their land and um, had they had to be forcibly removed and so he basically stated the only way to avoid fu future military conflict was to assimilate the children and one of the things that we found with the Methodist this Indian boarding school here in our research is the first thing that they would do is rename the children when they were accepted into the school. So we found a list of indigenous children's names, their indigenous name, and then their new European name, and then what happened to them. And quite a lot um, died under the care of the Methodists, now either from disease or mistreatment. What would you do if, as part of this archaeological project, you did discover bodies of children. In Oregon, first thing that happens if you discover any kind of human remains, um, there's a state police officer that's called and they have to come out with uh, and determine whether it's a crime scene or not first. Once it's determined that they're historical, um, then the tribes get involved and then um, uh, shippo and it becomes a whole ordeal. And if they if it turns out that they're a tribal or non-determinate but assumed to be tribal, um, we have to discuss what's going on with the project. Is the project, can the project be redesigned? Depending on the time that's found, that the people are found. Um, our goal is always to keep people buried where, or close as close to possible where they were initially put, um, laid to rest. The goal is to do enough work that you're never ahead of time that you the chances of disturbing an ancestor are very limited mm -hmm. i can't thank you enough for being my guest today on insight this has been an invaluable history lesson it's a history that i look forward to learning more about Kimberly, how do, can people learn more about what the city's doing? Could you tell us some, oh, where can you, they go? You can go to our website, cityofsalem.net, and uh, type in the search bar historic preservation, and you'll get uh, links to our current projects. And Chris? <laughs> um, we always invite people, if they want to learn more about Grand Ronde, to come visit the uh, Chalu Cultural and Heritage Center, or Museum. Um, we do uh, it's just we have rotating exhibits. There's a lot to learn about Grand Ronde out there, and that's usually the best starting place to come sort of learn about us. Well, Kimberly Fitzgerald and Chris Bailey, thank you so much for being my guest today on Insight, and thank you for joining us today on Insight. I'm Wendy Brokaw. One of the things about archaeology as a technique uh, for understanding the past is that it is a proof of a past. So from a tribal perspective, a representative of a tribe 
When you find an arrow point, a spear point, a stone bowl, or fragments from their manufacture, it is actually the evidence of those people on the landscape from thousands of years ago, hundreds of years ago. It is the physical proof of existence, as well as their children today. Yeah.